In 2010, the largest manhunt in modern British history was launched when Raoul Mote declared war on Northumbria police. For somebody to actively hunt a police officer, it's so sick. In just one week, the 37-year-old ex-con murdered and maimed in a vengeful rampage. You would have seen at least one policeman at any time, full body armor, gun the lot. For seven days, the former bouncer evaded over 500 officers. We had no idea where he was, and this man still had his gun. Sending a wave of terror through rural Northumberland. I thought, I'm sure to be next at this rate. I was just petrified. But what caused this father of three to snap and embark on a deadly killing spree? There's really only one way it's going to end. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. The 3rd of July, 2010, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England. A city known for its industrial past and vibrant nightlife. Over the years, Newcastle has acquired a real reputation as a party city. It's incredibly popular with stag do's and head and do's, um, uh, and it's a really vibrant nightlife. It's got a reputation as being a very friendly place, and it's the sort of city where you will run into the same people in, in the same pubs and clubs by no means a crime hotspot. In fact, it's a really safe area to live. So to, to, to experience what we experienced in July 2010 was way out of the normal for this area. As Friday night became Saturday morning, revelers filled Newcastle's clubs and bars, unaware that just seven miles away, one party was about to come to a tragic end. 2.30 a.m., Bertley. The sound of gunfire was about to ring out through the quiet residential streets. Following a night out at a local bar, Samantha Stobart and Christopher Brown visited a friend's house. Samantha and her new boyfriend, Christopher, were uh, enjoying a social evening with her parents and friends. The young couple were unaware that an armed man with deadly intent was hiding in wait outside. As their evening drew to a close, Samantha and Christopher prepared to leave. When both Samantha and Christopher emerged for the house, they confronted them. He immediately shot Christopher in the upper body, and then as Christopher tried to run away, he shot him a second time. While he was lying injured, he reloaded the gun and shot a defenceless, injured Christopher on the ground. The third shot proved to be fatal. He then turned his attention to Samantha, who was by this time inside the house, and he fired a shot through the window, and then he calmly walked away. With one dead and another critically injured, local journalist Sophie Doughty was one of the first to report on the deadly spree. The 3rd of July in 2010 was um, a normal Saturday shift for us, or, or so we thought when we came in. We rang around the emergency services, we got caught up with anything that had been happening overnight and told us that there was an incident going on in, in Berkeley. When police started releasing details, they described it as a domestic disturbance. When we got to the scene, local people were, were telling us that um, a, a man had been released from prison, come out there, shot his ex-girlfriend and shot her new partner. As the morning wore on, we were asking people, do you know who her ex-boyfriend was? And the name Raoul Moat was mentioned. Born on June the 17th, 1973, Raoul Thomas Moat had an unstable childhood. He's always been looking for his dad from being young, and his mum would never 
say who his dad was? He said a lot that he lacked a father figure, he lacked a, a standard normal family life. His early years were further complicated by his mother's mental health issues. His mum was never there. He was always living with his gran. She used to show him all the good qualities of life and look after him. He idolised her, and that was his main big happy zone. His mother remarried in 1986, and Raoul Mode's teenage years were marked by a fractious relationship with his stepfather. The stepdad didn't like Raoul too much and used to be off with him all the time. I don't even think that his man was there, uh, really looking after him too well even. So he was bit, getting a bit more withdrawn. At the age of 24, Moat severed contact with his family and after a series of failed relationships, met Samantha Stobart in 2004. The one thing that Raoul Moat was, was desperate to have was a stable family life. The one thing he didn't have as a child. Uh, and this he thought he would get with Samantha Stobart. But their six-year relationship broke down in 2010 when Moat was imprisoned for the assault of a relative. The 1st of July, 2010, 11 a.m. Her Majesty's Prison, Durham. Moat was released after serving just over two months of a 16-week sentence devastated by his broken relationship with Samantha Stobart. That time in prison gave him time to think. His jealousies were emphasised. His feelings of mistrust to towards Samantha were amplified. Immediately after being granted his freedom, he began to meticulously gather supplies for an attack and armed himself with a sawn-off shotgun, modifying the ammunition to make it even more lethal. A normal shotgun cartridge would contain um, an amount of ball bearings on top of the, the, the explosive charge. Moat removed um, a portion of those ball bearings and packed in smaller items of, of metal in there. Um, and I guess his mindset behind that was to cause maximum damage. At 2.40 a.m. on the 3rd of July, just 48 hours after his release, Moat put his plan into action, gunning down his ex-girlfriend, Samantha Stobart, and her new partner, Christopher Brown. On the surface, a vengeful attack by a jilted lover, but deep down, a festering resentment remained, and Raoul Moat's bloody spree was just beginning. Lost everything through you. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. The 3rd of July, 2010, Bertley, Tyne and Weir, watched over by the iconic Angel of the North. Overnight, this small town had become the scene of a violent crime. Less than 48 hours after being released from prison, 37-year-old Raoul Moat had shot his ex-girlfriend, Samantha Stobart, and murdered her new boyfriend, Christopher Brown, in a deadly killing spree. Moat had met Samantha six years earlier in 2004. He was a 31-year-old bouncer working in Newcastle's thriving club scene. She was just 16 years old. She had fake ID to get in because she was underage. And then he just met her from there and that's when he just started meeting her and he just seemed to have fell in love with her. He was a bodybuilder, so he used to wear these cut-out vests that showed, that showed everything off. So, yeah, he, he was really proud of his muscles and he thought he looked great. <laughs> she was young, she was good looking, she had a fantastic figure and he was a lot older than her and I think all his birthdays had come at once because he'd met her. After six years together, Samantha gave birth to a baby girl and Moat became a father once more having also won custody of two daughters from a previous relationship. I think being a father was very important to Raoul. It was something that he aspired. He aspired to be a good father. He had children from previous relationships to Samantha, and things hadn't worked out there. He hadn't achieved the perfect family. 
he had difficult, fractious relationships with girlfriends. He had difficult relationships with his children. And he had an incredibly difficult relationship with um, Samantha Stobart. He was a big uh, character, he was a big figure, he was intimidating. Moat has admitted to domestic violence in previous relationships, specifically with Sam Stubbart. He did that in a way where he portrayed her as being provocative, as if Sam made him do it. And this is something we see very commonly with domestic violence perpetrators. It was always Samantha's fault. Samantha shouldn't agitate him, or Samantha shouldn't do this, or he would hit her, she would come over here, and then he would come over here and sweet talk her and she'd go back and then she would be back for a few months and he would have an argument and he'd hit her again so she was back again. They position themselves to be the victim of emotional abuse or provocation and they say they lash out because they tried to be reasonable, they'd done everything else they could. Yet again, this is just an example of a narcissist manipulating the truth. On the 10th of June, 2010, whilst he was behind bars, Samantha took the opportunity to put a definitive end to her abusive six-year relationship with Moat, fabricating a story that her new partner was a police officer. When Moat shot and killed Chris Brown at point-blank range, Moat was still of the belief that Chris Brown was a police officer. Christopher Brown wasn't a police officer. That was simply something Samantha had used to try and keep Moat away. He was a karate instructor, and he was delivering leaflets around the doors when she met him. It just seemed like a normal lad who was trying to make a go of it, and his only sort of mistake, if you can call it a mistake, was he started a relationship with Raoul Moat's estranged girlfriend. She thought that by telling him her new boyfriend was a police officer, it would persuade Raoul to keep his distance. She couldn't have picked a worse profession in the world. He had a long running hatred and paranoia about the police, and this was yet another way in which he thought the police had taken something away from them. Moat had a history of dealings with Northumbria police. The vendetta he thought the Northumbria police had against him stretched back many, many years, um, largely based on fairly minor incidents. The police were always pulling him over for the slightest thing, and he was just absolutely sick of it. He says, every time I pull into a petrol station and there's a policeman there, the stop is. Or well, they would just pull him over, they'd check his fuel, they'd check his tyres. It was just like a non-stop harassment, so he was, he was always on edge. He became very paranoid about the police. His, his house had CCTV cameras around it. He recorded all his phone calls with social services and with the police. He blamed them for his businesses going bust. He blamed them for constantly being harassed. I said, well, they must have some reason. He says, I've never done anything. I think for Moat, that was his default setting. When something didn't go right in his life, he blamed the police. And he only had one route left to take in his eyes, which was to take revenge. 29 minutes past midnight, July the 4th, less than 24 hours after the shootings in Berkeley, Raoul Moat made a chilling phone call to the communications centre at Northumbria Police Headquarters. Hello there, this is Big Gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Moat. Um, what I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done, right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back, but one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, Northumbria Police had received uh, one phone call from Raoul Moat, effectively making full admissions to shooting Christopher Brown, uh, admissions to shooting Samantha, but more worryingly and sinister, uh, declaring an effective war, if you like, on Northumbria police officers. And you police have took too much off me over the years. I'm coming to get you, I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. I've lost everything through you, right? Just, just one fever alone, right? 
Because I am good for officers now. Earlier that evening, traffic officer PC David Rathband was starting his late shift with the force under heightened alert for the spree gunman from the previous night. David was a very proactive police officer. He completely understood the job. It's what he wanted to do. It was his calling, I think. 45 minutes past midnight. Moments after Moat's phone call to the police, PC Rathbund was sitting in his patrol car, unaware that his life was about to be turned upside down. David had uh, decided to sit up on the, the A1, one of his favourite stopping points, um, to sit up somewhere where it's very busy, where there's a high, um, a high volume of traffic coming past, and waiting. That's, that's what it all comes down to, playing the waiting game. Then maybe that opportunity for that vehicle, that one vehicle you're looking for, will come past. Um, unfortunately for David, the, that night it did. PC Rathbund was unaware Moat had changed vehicles and was now travelling in a black Lexus. The vehicle he was expecting or, or hoping to see had, uh, had been dumped earlier on that day. That intelligence hadn't got out yet. Um, and so David was effectively sat there waiting, looking for something that wasn't going to come past. The individual he was looking for did, though, in another car, and that's when it all went horribly wrong. Just moments after making his call to the emergency services, Moat's threat to the police became a brutal reality as his sickening spree continued. Moat, it transpires, drives past and sees David sat in his police car on his own um, and decides to stop just on the onslip for the motorway. He got out and carrying a sawn off shotgun, he crept up to a marked police car. PC Rathband was aware that somebody was behind his car. He turned, looked, and saw this large man holding a gun, pointing at him through the passenger window. And his last thought before he was shot was, oh no, it's Ralph Moat. And for that split second, he knew what was about to happen. David had been horrifically injured. He'd been shot twice in the face. He was left blind there and then. It's not the done thing, is it, to shoot a police officer. There's a line there that people don't cross. For somebody to actively go out and, and hunt a police officer, it's, it's so sick. Leaving his third victim fighting for his life, Ral Moat disappeared into the night amidst fears that his spree was far from over. There was a real sense of um, concern that PC Rathband wasn't going to be the final victim. Minutes later, an agitated Moat called Northumbria police once more. I've just told your officer that they're all along the west end of Newcastle. Yes. Well, absolutely not going to stop. You're not going to have to kill me. Right. He rang again, making it clear that he was responsible for shooting David Rathband, and again emphasising that he would be willing to shoot more police officers. He will come looking for us. The gunman's behaviour was becoming increasingly irrational. Northumbria police called an emergency press conference in an attempt to reach out to Moat. You have told us that the police are not taking you seriously. I can assure you, we are. I want you to know that you have our full attention. Innocent people have been hurt. This must stop now. With one dead, two in a critical condition, and with clear intent to kill again, the elusive moat needed to be caught before his killing spree claimed further victims. We had no idea where he was. We had no idea where he was hiding out and every inquiry that we made that was an attempt to secure his arrest was going to involve specialist firearms officers. There was a major manhunt then was launched and it became apparent that, you know, it was a story that none of us had ever experienced uh, before in our careers. In the period when we didn't know where Ralph was, 
you know, there were armed police raids going on all, all over Tyneside and it was moving all the time, but, but still there was no sign of rail mode. And I was completely terrified that week the police were looking for him. And I, I just never went to bed. I slept on the set either for the full week. It was just terrifying. Less than 24 hours after the shooting of PC Rathband, an unexpected twist emerged, and Moat's ruthless spree threatened to escalate further. Late on a Sunday afternoon was two reports, two separate reports, which suggested that he may have had hostages with him. And those were coming from the family of Carl Ness and the family of Korama Wai. As is typical in a hostage situation, the police request to the media that we don't report uh, that information because it may affect the safe recovery of the hostages. The dynamic became very, very complicated because we had an obligation to those hostages to try and save their lives. That caused some issues in terms of how we proceeded with the manhunt. The police were now aware that Moat was travelling in a black Lexus and the net was closing in on him. It made a distinctive engine noise. It was quite uh, noisy. And when we appealed to the public to help us find that car, very, very quickly it was identified and its location was identified. And our focus moved from almost a tiny and weird conurbation to the rural countryside of Northumberland to Rothbury. As the search moved into a new area and with the lives of two hostages in his hands, the need to find Moat took on a new urgency. His savage spree was potentially spiralling out of control. This man had threatened to kill police officers. This man had already shot a police officer. And this man, as far as we knew, still had his gun. Twenty-nine minutes past midnight, the 4th of July, 2010. Raoul Mote called the emergency services and declared war on Northumbria police. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. Moments later, he ambushed traffic officer PC David Rathband as he sat in his patrol car, shooting him twice at point-blank range before vanishing into the night with two hostages. Police had released details of Moat's vehicle, a black Lexus, and sightings were quickly reported in the community of Rothbury. Less than an hour outside of Newcastle, this small market town sits in the rolling hills of Northumberland. If you drive north through Newcastle, Rothbury's the first nice place you come to. It's everyone's idea of a little village in the hills. It's quite quaint. Everybody knows everybody else. It's a really tight community. It's just a lovely, wonderful place, and it's, um, it's yeah, it's just, it's just beautiful. But Rothbury was about to become the focus of the world's attention. Until the police car rode up the street, it was just an ordinary day, and I think the last thing we expected was to have anything to do with the whole moat saga at all. On the morning of the 6th of July, three days after moat's spree had begun, the black Lexus was found abandoned in a local car park. Just got to the office and I got a phone call to say, uh, Ram Moat's car's been found in Rothbury, get here now. I just thought, oh my God, this is Big. This is huge. This is something that's never happened before in our paper's history. The hunt for the gunman and his hostages intensified as police resources poured into the immediate area. When it first started, um, if you'd looked down here, you would have seen at least one policeman at any time. Full body armour, gun the lot. The manhunt would soon reach unprecedented levels, involving over 500 officers. A two-mile exclusion zone was set up in the Rothbury area. Anything that involved a sighting or any arrest of Raoul Moat was going to involve 
the use of armed police officers. There was no other way to do it. With the police on high alert for a potential hostage standoff, the story was about to take an unexpected turn. Relmote had already revealed that he had taken some hostages, but it became apparent as well that the police were unsure as to whether they were hostages or accomplices. Carl Ness and Karama Wan were in fact in collusion with Moat. They had each delivered two messages to their families. One appeared to be a genuine hostage letter, but the second was a note explaining that they were actually in the safe hands of their friend, Raoul Moat. Their concerned families submitted these letters to the police. While we were quickly trying to get our resources moved, Moat was able to melt into the countryside, whereas Ness and Awan tried to make their escape along the open road. Uh, the police helicopter was very quickly above them. One police car drove past them with an officer in to possibly identify them. Once he did that, he radioed to colleagues who followed in a second police car unmarked to throw a thunder flash at their feet. This momentarily stunned them, and other officers came out and arrested them uh, at gunpoint. With Ness and Awan in custody, the full extent of their involvement in Moat's spree started to become clear. Raoul Moat and Carl Ness were close friends, uh, Awan less so, but they um, they went with him on his um, exercise of revenge and, and murder. They drove him around on the night that he shot PC Rathband. Carl Ness was with him and drove him to Samantha Stobart's house. So there's no doubt that they were fully involved. Footage emerged that revealed the movements of Moat and his accomplices before and during his spree. They're caught on CCTV, you know, buying him things from Tesco and, and places. They even, you know, to them it seemed like a bit of an adventure. They were buying like barbecue sauce and, and all sorts of, of everyday items to help moat. But what led two men to assist Raoul Moat in his vengeful rampage? He was highly manipulative. He was able to make people feel as if they were in the wrong, as if they'd wronged him, and that gave him leverage and purchase to get other people to do what he wanted them to do. They were very unusual characters in this because they didn't seem to gain anything other than, in a way, looking up to Moat. They wanted to impress him. They were more than willing to help him carry out these horrific acts, and there was nothing in it for them. Carl Ness, a bodybuilder and former nightclub doorman, had known Moat for several years, having also worked as a bouncer in Newcastle. During Moat's incarceration, Ness had been in regular contact with Moat through prison visits and telephone calls. But one conversation was really interesting in that he asked Ness to get a particular individual to visit him while he was in prison because he was an individual who could get him what he described was a car with six wheels. And when we looked at the people involved, uh, my only explanation for a car with six wheels is a gun and the associated ammunition. The 7th of July, 2010, Rothbury, Northumberland. The day following the arrests of Awan and Ness. With Moat still at large, police discovered a makeshift campsite where he'd been hiding out. Amongst the debris, a disturbing message from Moat was found, forcing the police to take urgent action. The police called us all in for like, an emergency press conference and told us that they had found a dictaphone that, that Moat had, had left in one of the places that he'd been camping out. On that, he gives details of the fact that he's been following the media coverage, that he'd been angered by it. He was getting very, very agitated by the way he was being portrayed in the press. And he decided that, or he declared on that dictaphone that for every lie that was told, he would shoot an innocent member of the public. Information has now emerged that Mr Moat has made threats towards the wider public. 
Fearing for public safety, a media blackout was imposed. Police told us about this threat and the request to um, not publish the material that might upset Ralph Moat. When they explained the reason why, I think it was a collective draining of colour from faces because it, none of us wanted to put anyone at any further risk than they already were at. The 8th of July, two days after the arrest of Ness and Awan, and Moat was still on the run. He no longer had a car, he no longer had access to, uh, to money or, as far as anyone knew, no longer had access to the outside world. He wasn't in touch with anybody else. Um, so his ability to move around had clearly been reduced. But how was this former nightclub bouncer evading capture in the Northumbrian wilderness? We knew he had a love of Rothbury. He holidayed frequently in, in Rothbury. He enjoyed camping. It was an area that was familiar to him. We actually spoke to an ex-girlfriend of his who lived in the village. Um, he used to go fishing there. He knew the area, so he knew what he was doing. You always feel more comfortable in an environment that you're familiar with. Uh, you know, you can relax, get in tune, take stock and make a plan from there. Despite the two-mile exclusion zones set up by the police, the challenging terrain provided Moat with plenty of opportunities to remain invisible. It's quite rugged terrain. There's lots of farms, there's lots of fields. There's probably lots of places that you could hide out that a lot of people wouldn't know about. If you look at the amount of forest round here, that's a great place to be straight away because the helicopter can't see you, the police can't see you. There's a mnemonic we use when we're looking at hides, and that mnemonic is bliss. And the B stands for blends. You've got to look at a place and you want to try and blend in with your natural environment. The L stands for low. When people are looking for you, there's almost like a natural tendency to just look at eye level. The I is irregular. Make it irregular. Stay away from straight lines. The S is for small. Keep it small, anything too big, and it's just going to jump out at you. And the last one, the second S, is secluded. Once you get out of here, you are in the middle of nowhere. That's a good place to hide out. People aren't going to see you. There's nobody there to see you. As the police search continued, with no reported sightings of Moat, tension in the Rothbury area was rising. People were scared. Everyone was conscious that there was a, an armed and dangerous man on the loose. Rumours were rife, and fears were growing that the gunmen could even be living amongst them. There were rumours that Ralmo had gone into the centre of the village during the manhunt. Just over here is a storm drain, um, where it's thought that Ralmo was hiding out. People were saying that there are storm drains that lead underneath the village that you could go from remote area and actually end up coming up through a drain in the village. So you can nip in in the early hours of the morning and just become a scavenger. Scavenging in, in the bins, in allotments, greenhouses. These are the gardens behind the wall where it's thought that uh, Ralmite was going in to steal vegetables and food. Like the guy at the bottom of the village who found that his tomatoes were going missing. I mean, there were different sightings of in different places. There was a house that he potentially went into and lay down on the bed because a, a resident had reported like an imprint of his head in their pillow. As Moat continued to remain one step ahead of the police, local residents were becoming increasingly unnerved. Well, I think there was a little moment of panic because obviously when the police are telling you to get in, lock the doors, stay away from the windows, you're assuming there's going to be bullets flying all over the place. No one quite knew how much ammunition or how many guns he, he had possession of. And it was, there was a real sense of fear throughout the area. When public safety is your priority, the police had saturated Rothbury so that in the event of any sighting or any confrontation, between a member of the public and Moat, the police were on their heartbeat away. At 7.25 p.m. on the 9th of July, six days after the vengeful rampage began, a member of the public reported sighting a man answering Moat's description on the banks of the river near the centre of Rothbury. As armed police descended, a standoff developed as Moat raised the gun used to carry out his deadly spree. But this time, 
the weapon was pointing at his own head. It was his intention that it would end in that field in Rothbury that night. At 2.40 a.m. on the 3rd of July, 2010, Raoul Moat embarked on a vengeful killing spree, leaving one dead and two more critically wounded. Moat's car was finally found abandoned three days after his rampage began in the quaint Northumbrian town of Rothbury. Seven twenty-five p.m. the 9th of July, Rothbury Riverside. Having evaded capture for a further three days, a member of the public reported sighting moat on the banks of the river Kukut. Reports came through that he'd finally been cornered in an area of, on the edge of Rothbury Town Centre. Press and public were immediately cleared from the area as armed police descended on the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, for your own safety, and need you to move back. back. Round Moat was just in front of the tree over there. Police were kind of on this um, road here. Being local, we knew straight away where it was, and we knew he wasn't going to get away. He sunk to his knees, put the gun to his head, and uh, the next final hours of Moat's life were played out on the riverbank. As the standoff between police and Raoul Moat unfolded, the nation was captivated by rolling 24-hour news. It was a waiting game during the, the hours where there was a standoff between Moat and the police. It was live on every news channel that there was. And as journalists at the newspaper, all we could do was, was watch and wait. Just being glued to the television at night and waiting for things to happen. The whole world seemed to be transfixed on what was happening in Rothbury. That whole process of getting him to surrender was, was happening, uh, and it went on and on. This is um, where the standoff took place. Um, it was around this area here. It's where Raumoit was with the gun underneath him. Our armed officers, our negotiators, were there for the long haul. Behind the scenes, police have been analysing Moat's behaviour throughout the spree, preparing for every eventuality. Because Moat had made contact with us a couple of times on telephone, there was always the likelihood that we were going to confront him face to face. So a team of negotiators had been working all week for that eventuality. They knew his background, they knew what made him tick, and they knew what annoyed him. He spoke emotionally about close relationships. He, he, he was immune to any requests that they made of him. And start trying to persuade him that killing himself was not the only option. After six hours of negotiation, the mood of the stalemate changed as Moat became increasingly agitated. You couldn't really see what was happening, but you could hear that there was a commotion. At that point, it was clear to everybody present that he had made his mind up, that he was ready to finish the whole episode. The police attempted to incapacitate Moat with a shotgun-style taser. At about quarter past one in the morning, about six hours now after the, um, the standoff had started, um, there were a couple of sounds which clearly sounded like gunshots, and there were a couple of shouts. Uh, it wasn't quite clear at that point, uh, as the story broke, as to what, what had happened. Uh, was it Moat committing suicide? Was it the police trying to take action? At approximately 1.15 a.m., Almost immediately after the police tasers were discharged, Raoul Moat fired the final shot of his killing spree. Shortly after, an ambulance um, crew took him to um, Newcastle General Infirmary, and shortly after his arrival there, it became known that he was actually dead. 
um, and he'd taken his own life with um, the shotgun that he'd had with him throughout that week. After the biggest British manhunt of a generation, involving over 500 police officers and costing Northumbria police in excess of £1 million, Raoul Moat's ruthless rampage was finally over. With him, it seemed that it, it, it had come to a point where he didn't have anything. And when you get to that point, when you start feeling like that, then there's really only one way it's going to end. And he had actually said to the, the negotiators that uh, it was his intention that it would end in that field in Rothbury that night. Once you come out of an environment like this, particularly on your own, it gives you a lot of time to self-reflect. Come the end of it, I think because he'd been out for three days in a while, I think he kind of thought hard about what he's done and who he's let down, including himself. And uh, I think that's why it ended the way it did. I think it had finally come to it. And he'd, uh, he'd, he'd just hit the point of no return. In the wake of Moat's bloody violence, one question remained. What drove the former bouncer and bodybuilder to commit these terrible crimes? Moat was an individual who could not cope with all of the things that were happening to him that were going wrong. And there often tends to be a triggering event, something that happens in the immediacy that they can't cope with that tends to push them over the edge. Jealousy, pure jealousy that I think he's done it. Um, jealousy that he couldn't have Samantha, so he's going to make sure nobody else had her. He couldn't change his situation with Stobart. There was nothing he could do to win her back. She'd replaced him with what he was fearful of, was a better man. He didn't want to go quietly. He thought, if I'm going to lose everything, I want everyone to know that. I want to get revenge on the people that have wronged me, but also, I don't want them to forget me. I'm not, I'm not just going to walk away. I'm going to make people notice me. And that's the key hallmark of spree killers with narcissistic backgrounds. They blame everybody else, they blame society, they blame the authorities, and other people need to be made to pay. The 29th of February, 2012, 19 months after the devastating spree. Having been shot and blinded by Raoul Moat, PC David Rathband, took his own life at his home in Blythe, Northumberland. David is gone. Um, I miss my friend. I still can't quite bring myself to delete his number off of my phone. It's still there. Uh, would David Rothband have taken his own life had he not been blinded by Royal Mort? I, I, I personally doubt it very much. Samantha Stobart still bears the scars, and I'm sure she probably finds it difficult to move on. And Christopher Brown lost his life. Christopher's mum, Sally, uh, feels like her son is a forgotten one here, and, and, and I tend to agree with her. On the 11th of March, 2011, Moat's accomplices, Carl Ness and Kurama Wan, were convicted of the attempted murder of PC David Rathband and conspiracy to murder police officers. Ness was also convicted of the murder of Christopher Brown. When you look at Carl Ness, who was given a 40-year life sentence, and Awan, who was given 20-year life sentences, you think, what would Moat have got? And I think I'd rather see him uh, accounting for his criminality, for the deaths of Christopher and David. I'd rather see him accounting for them in, in prison rather than taking the easy route, which he did, which was cowardly.